Hi, this is Ryan Lester uh, here again at Venture Beat Transform event in San Francisco. It's been a great day. We're actually at the end of day one. Uh, most of the content here is wrapped up, but it's really been an outstanding uh, no a number of presentations, panels, really great networking. And I'm excited to wrap up the day today talking to uh, GP. Uh, GP, welcome. Hi, Ryan. How are you? Yeah, doing really well. Great to have you here. Uh, so to start out, a GP works for Accenture and uh, really excited to talk about his experience in the AI world, doing a lot of work around uh, reinforcement learning. Uh, he has a lot of technical depth and expertise. Uh, he's written a number of books. Uh, and so GP, why don't you start and talk a little bit about your current role at Accenture and some of the work you're doing there. Yeah, at Accenture, uh, we have uh, a special data science platform called Accenture Discovery Lab which is a FedRAMP uh, certified program for most of the federal uh, organizations. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also have a number of uh, data science and machine learning uh, tools that are specifically built for different types of industries like aerospace or uh, healthcare, retail, supply chain management, life sciences, CPG, um, and a number of other industries. So uh, we have a lot of customers that are uh, uh, ramping up on uh, this FedRAM certified program. And we also have Accenture Research Labs where we are uh, building the uh, um, applications on reinforcement learning um, for gearing towards AGI, artificial general intelligence. And uh, we are expanding uh, these applications and uh, they are actually, some of the applications can be installed for customers directly, uh, covering various industries. That's great, and I think one of the cool things about certainly working at Accenture is the breadth of companies you work with. Yeah. So you're dealing with healthcare one day, you know, manufacturing another day, right. retail another day, right. and also, you know, so one, you're getting those best practices across those industries, but two, it also gives you access to data sets that really, you know, are right. often unavailable to the exactly. average company. Yes. So, so it's a really exciting space. Um, so, uh, I, you know, once again, I said you've written a number of books. I think you bring a wealth of information. There's a couple of topics I want to touch on today mm -hmm. that I think I've heard throughout sessions and even some of the stuff you, you talked about today. So looking at the world of reinforcement learning and some of the work being done with TensorFlow. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so can we talk, let's start on that as a topic of what are you seeing that's coming out of the world of TensorFlow and how's that helping to take some of this technology and make it more approachable, more scalable, more repeatable? Yeah, so I would start with the earlier successes in AI. So basically the whole trend of uh, artificial intelligence began like in 1950s, and then the trend started shifting in uh, 1980s uh, for building knowledge-based systems, which are like rule-based systems. So programs are encoded with millions of rules to perform specific uh, tasks and execute them. And uh, the trend has uh, slowly shifted from the knowledge-based systems uh, around like in 2000, reinforcement learning has picked up the momentum. And uh, earlier, even before that, there were a lot of other types of uh, machine learning algorithms that were applied, like mostly leveraging supervised and unsupervised learning. Mm -hmm. And from 2000 onwards, it, the momentum has picked up through Bayesian uh, networks, uh, neural networks, and uh, uh, several other types of uh, different algorithms. And as we progress, uh, somewhere around 2012, the second shift of uh, artificial intelligence has begun. Uh, that is with uh, deep neural networks, uh, with deep learning technique. Because whatever the tasks that uh, companies were leveraging with labeled data, uh, not just for neural networks, it can be performed with uh, thousands of layers um, of uh, neural networks, which is a great groundbreaking revolution on the machine learning side. And then slowly, if we uh, take a look at uh, the recent trends of reinforcement learning, there are around 16,625 papers published from 90s all the way to uh, 2018 uh, in November. And that shows a significant uh, momentum of reinforcement learning where not only uh, for the research publications, but most of the practical applications in the real world, uh, the companies are applying this into um, their industries and uh, they're building uh, several uh, applications uh, with on practically every industry. It could be manufacturing, it could be uh, building uh, smart factories uh, with industrial automation, or it could be smart cities to solve like a problem like, a, for example, like a deep traffic, mm -hmm. um, or it could be infrastructure, or it could be uh, healthcare. Like Intel has uh, built several um, 
tools for uh, uh, healthcare side for uh, chemotherapy, cl clinical trials, mm. uh, trying to solve the uh, uh, cure for cancer. Uh, several types of uh, applications have been built and it's, it's not uh, isolated to the gaming environment anymore. Yeah. That was the breakthrough where uh, DeepMind's yeah. AlphaGo started defeating the human players yes. uh, and Dota 2 and OpenAI. Uh, several other uh, companies have started moving into this space, but uh, it has been now uh, moved into the consumer space where uh, even companies like eBay, uh, just for e-commerce, for example, have applied for auctions uh, just without any historical data sets, just picks up the consumer trends on the fly yes. and it provides the recommendations. Unlike the Amazon recommendation system that requires a historical data sets to provide uh, different types of recommendations for people to purchase the books. Uh, so this is a significant uh, uh, momentum in reinforcement learning and I believe that's where it's going to be because it's the most promising artificial intelligence technique that we have seen um, over the decades and it's going to be getting towards the artificial general intelligence because um, it's just about to build um, uh, multi-dimensional uh, uh, neural networks and uh, trying to uh, solve the problem to gear towards the AGI. Yeah, that's great. And I, one thing I, I, that you're saying that really resonates with me is at an event like this, there's the academics part of it, so the p pure research being done right. at universities and even at large companies like exactly. Google. Um, then there's the open source research or open source work of how do we take some of that primary research and then turn into tools that a community can use and continue exactly. to invest in. Yes. Then there's the platform research of, okay, well then how's Google leveraging that or exactly. Amazon or, or yes. IBM or even Accenture. Right. And then there's the actual applications, of the, the business applications of, okay, right. now we're gonna make it more productized. We're gonna mm -hmm. make it something that a business user can use. And what's interesting is that the, when you when you were whining, you look at where things were with Go and, and, and the earlier stages, it was a little more closed. It was more university and then very large exactly. enterprise. Yeah. And that was it. And now there's all these different pockets of innovation that are feeding off each other mm -hmm. across a variety of different areas. And it's really exciting. Right. You see it at an event like this, but also I think your, your story really reinforces that. Exactly. So that's why like, if, if you're taking a look at uh, a lot of frameworks and stacks of reinforcement learning, uh, TensorFlow is a building block um, and uh, Python uh, yes. is another good framework for reinforcement learning. And PyTorch uh, also is very good in reinforcement learning. Uh, most of the stuff uh, is now moving to PyTorch because the tensors uh, actually can compute on the GPUs as opposed to compute on the CPUs yes. with Python because Python cannot compute on the CPUs unless like we get an enterprise Jupyter lab and then kind of run it on uh, such kind of a cloud yeah. computing yeah, yeah. scale. Yeah. But now uh, we can start moving this towards uh, the tensors. I think the PyTorch would be the future of reinforcement learning in my opinion because uh, it has all the right infrastructure and uh, programming language is so lucid and it's so easier uh, for people to just start building the applications without having to uh, start from scratch. Leveraging the knowledge of Python, they can just incorporate it into PyTorch. That's great. Yeah, so, so it's another advancement also, once again, making it approachable, making it easier for folks to use. That's great. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, so another thing I know that you uh, spend a lot of time on is GANs, um, you know, generative at, at, at adversarial networks of, you know, you're using things to, you know, create the, the, the fake or create the, the, uh, the output and then use our system to then test that output of the quality and is it moving in the direction you want. So, you know, people think about like deep fakes of videos or image generation or natural language generation of, hey, I'm going to put a text input in and I want the system to generate a voice output that sounds natural and meets the requirements. So that's another big space. Like what are you seeing as exciting in that GAN space as well? So Salesforce actually has implemented the reinforcement learning for text generation and text summary, NLG, NLP. Yep. And uh, basically it can uh, generate the text on the fly by reading whole uh, paragraphs of text and then converting into uh, natural language generation. So that's uh, one of the biggest breakthroughs that we have seen in the recent times with Salesforce. And as far as the generative adversarial networks are concerned, I think they're creating uh, uh, some breakthrough scientific advancements in uh, neuroscience. Um, mm -hmm. Like for example, understanding the, the structure of the brain's uh, brain networks is not fixed. Um, or like trying to understand the genomics uh, or trying to uh, apply this to pharma industries where we can bring the uh, uh, product to the consumer much quicker than uh, like going through multiple clinical trials 
because the GANs can uh, generate this type of uh, products that can allow us to scan through the genomics much quicker. So I think in healthcare, we are going to have significant revolution in terms of GANs. Um, and uh, also, I mean, GANs is not specific to uh, any particular topic. Yeah, 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 or even area of AI, like a it could be, yeah, it could be language, as yeah, it could be uh, yeah. uh, manufacturing, it could yes. be aerospace, it could be anything. I mean, yes. so I think that's where I see there will be more practical applications, uh, day-to-day -day life. Uh, consumers can actually leverage them. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Um, the last thing I think that was really interesting, I, I think you had written uh, an article or, or cited an article on Twitter about this was um, reinforcing and deep cue learning. And some of the stuff that they had done in, uh, in FIFA 2018 or FIFA 18 around uh, free kicks. Uh, so I'm interested in hearing a little more about, about that space. Yeah, I mean, the whole uh, reinforcement learning has been built on the mathematical foundations of uh, Marco decision processes, where um, so basically it starts with an infinite horizon and it starts uh, with uh, S, which is for um, infinite space, yep. and then A is for like infinite action. And then there is a P, which is a transition function. Mm -hmm. So the whole mathematical formula that can be calculated is based on the rewards with the current state and the future, uh, rather than on the historical data sets. Mm. That's where we see like uh, most of the uh, applications like DeepMind's AlphaGo. It just calculates on the fly because it doesn't have any historical data sets. And it has a success rate of like 99.8%. Wow. And again, same thing when it's being applied to, for example, like uh, deep traffic. MIT technology has crowdsourced the algorithm and uh, 24,000 entries have been received uh, from different people. It has generated 96.6 years of uh, reinforcement learning um, simulations. So that shows that uh, the reinforcement learning can be applied for smart cities and it, be, it can be applied for solving any problem. I mean, it doesn't have to be uh, restricted to gaming, yes. where people have uh, significantly, I mean, that's a breakthrough where people have seen that, but it can be applied to any other industry. Uh, so I think uh, the deep queue learning uh, can be applied uh, extensively to healthcare. And we also have seen some successes with uh, JP Morgan and IBM. Uh, IBM has applied reinforcement learning for stock trading, mm. and uh, JP Morgan has applied for trade execution. Um, where they can actually um, execute the entire stocks just with reinforcement learning. Wow. Just picks up the trends dynamically on the fly, and then it starts executing that trading. It unlike the uh, classical machine learning that requires a whole a lot of uh, uh, historical yes. data sets where yes. it has to read and then understand the trends and then apply it. It doesn't really require so much of data. And Google has also applied for several uh, applications of robotics. Uh, OpenAI has applied on robotics, uh, where uh, there it just goes for offline training, which is not actual data, but then it can actually start uh, the in the live environment, um, uh, the data, the, and then it just picks up the trends, just like LIDAR sensors yep. uh, picks up the trends uh, on the objects, yep. and just from the objects around the uh, cars, and then it tries to navigate in the different kind of environments mostly in complex environments. Yes. Uh, that, that has been already achieved by Tesla and some other cars for LIDAR. Um, uh, and uh, specifically, uh, deep queue learning can be applied for a situation like that. It can be applied for including space exploration, for example. Uh, I mean, NASA is uh, making some uh, breakthrough um, um, technological advancements where they're sending uh, some space vehicles to different uh, planets and other places. Yes. Uh, I mean, uh, they're sending to exoplanets or yes. uh, planets yeah, in, yeah, outside of our solar system. Uh, yeah. Yes. So uh, there, the landscape is unknown when they land on a specific uh, planet. It's not that the algorithm has a prior knowledge of the environment, yes. how the surface looks like, yes. or how the gravity is, yes. how the navigation is. So the reinforcement learning can dynamically pick up these trends on the fly, and then it can start navigating through some. Uh, complex environments. So that's where I think the deep queue learning can be uh, significantly applied through um, on policy learning, off policy learning, uh, gradient methods, um, and different techniques of uh, reinforcement learning. Well, that's great. And I think the thing that's interesting there is that there's two aspects that I find fascinating of. One is your, your 
predicting a future state. So you're like, mm -hmm. this is where we think the future state will be. Now, mm -hmm. how do we model it in a way that mm -hmm. we can then build algorithms and a system to, you know, build the dials and, can, and understand uh, what can we control and influence. Mm -hmm. um, but then two is that uh, you're, you're, you're taking that really complex system and making it something that you can model and visualize and then make a decision on. Mm -hmm. And so those two things are really interesting of you're predicting a future state and then building a model around that future state. That, that is like a real model, not a made-up mm -hmm. model. Mm -hmm. uh, something that you, know, you feel like you, you have confidence in, 99% right. or more confidence in. Mm -hmm. But then two, you're packaging in a way that then a human can make a decision to mm -hmm. say, should we do this or should we not do it? Or what variables do we want to play with to then exactly. get better output? Exactly, that is a significant difference between regular machine learning and reinforcement learning because the machine learning only looks for outcomes of prediction. Yes. The reinforcement learning goes for actions. Actions, exactly which right. Which is dynamic. Exactly right, and I think there was, there was a good, uh, you, had, you had done a, a video or a, a presentation about just how like when you get into multi-dimensional system or multi-dimensional neural networks, right. it becomes too much for, mm -hmm. like our brains can't process it. Right. Uh, either visually or even in the way your, our, the data comes out. Right. And so not only are we building these systems to be more, handle more complex data sets, more complex problems, right. but also how do we make it something that as a human, um, we can actually process and then say, okay, now I understand what the system's telling me. Right. Let's go play with this variable. Right. And see what comes out, what comes out of it. So I think there's interesting investment in both those sides that's really fascinating and once again to your point expanding the art of the possible. Right. So uh, I think the way uh, the good thing is for reinforcement learning uh, the data doesn't have to be massive volume uh, it can take some parameters and yep. it can perform some hyperparameter uh, optimization tuning yep. and basically it provides uh, the insights uh, of the environment and, and make uh, dynamic decisions on the fly. Yep. And uh, uh, whereas, like, if you're going for uh, supervised or unsupervised learning, uh, it's mostly on the uh, label data. I mean, without yes. label data, it cannot predict any outcomes. Yes. But people are not looking for just outcomes. They're looking for actions, recommendations, um, like, for example, for e-commerce. Uh, that's where, uh, uh, you know, there will be a significant breakthrough. I'm also writing a book on PyTorch, actually, with uh, deep reinforcement learning, covering all the algorithms and... Uh, we're setting up some demo on some of these applications to see how these algorithms actually do work. Um, and uh, I think that will uh, provide uh, various types of uh, uh, problems and uh, how to be solved these uh, problems with uh, reinforcement learning. That's great. Uh, awesome. That sounds fantastic. Uh, so, uh, so we're here at this VentureB Transform Summit. I guess what's the one thing or two things that you're hoping to get more from out of this summit? What are some topics that you're hoping to hear more about while you're here? I think uh, I have heard about uh, natural language processing, okay. uh, which has been making some significant uh, uh, advancements in terms of uh, text generation, NLG, natural language generation, yep. and how it can be actually be brought to uh, the consumer. Because uh, the, the great thing about this uh, venture beat conference is, is it's not just about the technology, but how it actually integrates with the business. Yes, absolutely. It, how it can reach out to the consumer and how it benefits them. And that's what I, what I saw is because some of the conference I went, it was uh, more completely technical conferences, yeah. but the consumer was looking for what is that we are gaining from it or yes. what, where do we get started uh, yes. to build these business applications or uh, how do we take this further or what kind of industries can benefit. I think that's where I see a lot of people coming from different, different industries and uh, they're sharing their success stories from so many types of uh, applications, so many types of industries. That is what is fascinating in my, uh, that's my uh, take on uh, Venture Bridge Summit. Yeah, that's great. I, I couldn't agree more of that. That overlap to me between the technology but then the business application. Exactly. The, the value is yeah, so critical. It's both. I mean, there is technology, Agreed. there is business as well. So that gives a comprehensive understanding of how both can integrate and how we can build some solid products. That's great. And then uh, the other thing, a fun question I'd like to ask is just, is there, is there a hyped part of, of, of the AI industry that you feel like is you know, a little bit ridiculous these days? Yeah, I mean, there is something that what I've been thinking about is astrophysics. I mean, um, I read a few books about uh, different theorems that were proposed through uh, astrophysics. Uh, like Big Bang, for example, yes. that whole universe expanded from a Big Bang. Um, I mean, none of these are actually uh, reproducible in a lab environment. Uh, so it's hard for me to understand how the AI works um, on, the, on the classification of galaxies or clusters or how does it actually be helped uh, in the real world application. So 
Um, I mean, there are, there are also a few thoughts, like whether it is astrophysics a junk science or is it a real science? Yes. Because it, it, anything that we cannot reproduce through a scientific methodology or we can support is actually not considered as real science because it's, it's more like a junk science. Yes, yes. So, you, you, and it goes back to your point earlier about like, if, you, if you can't understand the model and the system, exactly, uh, then you can't build a, 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 a simulation of it. Yes. Uh, and so therefore, you know, it's, 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 you're building a simulation of something that does not sound science. Exactly, because uh, uh, science is always reproducible yes, and yeah, something agreed, that agreed. people can actually leverage that application and um, they can see the scientific evidence of how it actually works. Yeah, and but, I think a great thing you hear too at this event is just that where you can find those really good applications, you're like, I know this is my problem or I know this is the, the, the system I'm trying to optimize, then you have a much higher success yes. rate because you know what you're going after. Exactly. Whereas if it's unknown or there's a lot of complexity or it's too complex, right. then it becomes very hard because then you're, you're managing too many variables in the system. Exactly, because uh, I mean, even like when they predicted about this uh, Shoemaker Levi 9, Yes. Uh, in 1994, I think, yes. uh, they said that it's coming towards Earth. And it ended up going to Jupiter and yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. annihilated yeah. the whole Jupiter with some 600,000 tons of TNT, which is like 100,000 times of uh, Earth's total nuclear arsenal. But we couldn't predict that. So most of the things we are predicting, like, for example, uh, fast radio bursts that are coming from different galaxies. Yes. Uh, astrophysicists are predicting that these are the alien signals. Uh, we haven't actually seen any aliens so far. Um, yes. and, <laughs> and so that's where I'm not understanding how AI is discovering this yes. type of signals and yes. how it is uh, predicting the existence of aliens. Uh, same thing they're predicting about uh, gamma ray bursts uh, occurring in different galaxies. Yes. How that whole thing uh, can be actually be reproduced um, in, in the actual lab or yes. at some industry or something. So. Some of the applications from astrophysics always uh, baffle me in terms of like how we can actually practically reproduce these applications, uh, not just for commercial implementation for industries, but something people can actually leverage, like uh, proposing theorems of uh, alien uh, civilizations, uh, uh, sending the fast radio burst. Yes. Uh, is, is something I would uh, think is, is a hype cycle. Yeah, I yeah, agree. Yeah. yeah. It's people just taking like the excitement of the space and then yeah, applying. I mean, there is no reproducible science. alien that people can discover <laughs> from those uh, fast radio bursts. Yeah, agreed. So. Agreed. Well, good. Well, well, certainly I think on the opposite side of the coin, a lot of great work around reinforcement learning, you know, applications of AI. I think the work you guys are doing at Accenture sounds really exciting. And I obviously enjoyed your time here and our conversation today. So thank you so much for that. Thank you very much. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Really appreciate uh, meeting you. Yeah, it's great. And then for those of you watching, thank you so much. Uh, we, we're doing more of these interviews tomorrow, so please tune back in tomorrow. Um, and we'll be doing additional live streams of the presentations on the main stage and these interviews. Uh, and obviously, feel free to hit us up on Twitter, Facebook, et cetera, with questions or comments. And thank you so much for, uh, for your time and attention. Take care.